Hello everyone, um, I have the honor and the pleasure to have here with me for this interview Professor, uh, Professor John Newell Price, which is one of the biggest experts of, uh, of Cushing syndrome and those adrenal insufficiency in the world and in the general, in the, uh, generally in the context of neuroendocrinologists, also one of the leading experts um, worldwide. Um, Thank you very much, Professor Newell Price, for, for accepting this, this interview. Um, the topic of this interview is um, actually the um, statement that uh, Newell Price and other colleagues took in some of the recent, um, some of the recent publication and involved basically changing the name of uh, diabetes insipidus in uh, um, in the and that's that's in the in basically arginine vasopressin. vasopressin um, deficiency, and uh, I wanted to to talk about this this topic with him today. And I will ask you, as a first question, why now in 2023 should we change this the name of uh, this disorder? That, as I saw, as I read in one of your paper, is in uh, exists since um, since uh, 88 the 80s of uh, of uh, of Christ so already in the Greek in the Greek time. Why should we now change that? So good morning, Mario. Yeah. And thank you for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to speak to you and others on the on on the webinar. Um, the main driver to consider changing the name from diabetes insipidus to another name is for patient safety. That's the main driver. And the reason for this is that we have recognized for, for, for many years that there is confusion between diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus, not for endocrinologists. For endocrinologists, it's easy. But the problem is, is the patients are presenting to hospitals, to other healthcare workers, not endocrinologists, and they don't understand the difference. And there have been examples of uh, harm coming to patients, including deaths, where desmopressin has been omitted and the patient has become hyponatremic and dehydrated. Uh, and many of the cases where there's been sufficient confusion that patients with uh, vasopressin deficiency are having their blood sugar levels monitored and their fingers being pricked whilst they are an inpatient. And so really it's the case that uh, some very high profile cases came to light where some people would come to harm from death. Subsequently, uh, this then gave the impetus to consider what could be done to try and improve patient safety. So the change in the name is one part of improving patient safety, but it's, it's we believe, an important part. So what has happened is that an international working party has uh, got together uh, and this has got multi-society representation, including the European Society of Endocrinology, including the Endocrine Society, including other societies um, around the globe from Australia, Japan, Brazil, uh, et cetera. So there is a wide representation. And in addition and in parallel to that, uh, there's some work done uh, that was really led from Miriam Christ Crane and others in Basel where there was a survey of more than a thousand patients uh, with what we used to call diabetes insipidus. And in that survey, the question was raised to how their care was being delivered, whether there were, were problems with the care. And it was identified that there was many times that they were faced with this confusion between diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus. And around about 85% favored a name change. And the working group has thought very carefully and has worked with um, patient groups, a very active patient group in the United States and other uh, patient groups uh, and the Pituitary Foundation in the UK. And they have worked to consider what that name would be. And the name that is being suggested is AVP deficiency or arginine vasopressin deficiency or arginine vasopressin resistance. Lots of other names were considered, but they are the ones which really, after a lot of thought, and when one considers what the abbreviations may be, uh, have been the ones. And we would hope that that would at least allow, and once it percolates through um, medical nomenclature, that that would then allow 
patients to be identified with something that wasn't diabetes mellitus and actually would be better for their patient care, recognizing that this takes a huge amount of time and there'll be inertia and for sure in many years to come, people will still be referring to diabetes insipidus. Uh, thank you very much. And that's come to for my second question. Um, how, in your opinion and the opinion of the group, is it possible to change now after more than 2000 years um, the, the name of this disorder? So what do you suggest um, to change it? So do you suggest, for instance, in medical records to write both names or what are your suggestions to um, start now this new, uh, using this new name? We no longer refer to vagueness granulomatosis because uh, of vagueness uh, political issues. Um, and so it is possible to change a name. And the way that we are setting about it is firstly to um, make awareness. So we've published editorials widely in all of the major journals of the various endocrine societies involved in this. So there have been now, I think, uh, eight or nine or, or, or some such number of editorials published amongst many different journals. So that's raising awareness. Uh, the second is we are working and aiming to work with the uh, ICD-11 and the SNOMED coding systems to try and then make sure that this is a recognized nomenclature because that will be important for um, identification, coding, reimbursement, etc. And in addition to that, uh, those on the group, certainly we are using the names in both our clinic letters and um, in uh, chapter writing of the new textbooks that are coming out where you will have arginine-based pressing deficiency brackets, cranial diabetes insipidus, close brackets, and that will continue uh, so that this person mm -hmm. eventually, one would then hope that the parentheses would eventually be, be dropped. Um, and then in terms of what we're all doing, we're all now giving those types of things to the lectures that we gave to medical students. So that's the sort of bottom-up approach. And I think the more people that can do that, the more accepted such a change uh, will be. But from the top-down approach, it's a, a, a coding level and that type of thing. So both approaches, and, and, and particularly if this is then adopted by the next generation of endocrinologists coming through, then there's every reason to think that it would be possible to change. Okay, and then, then come to the third question. What can, as you mentioned, the future generation, what can, uh, for instance, the NER Young Research Com uh, Committee or the next generation of endocrinologists in general do to start this new change process or this new name process? What do you have any suggestion what we could do? Um, uh, both in your clinics and in education of the patients and when you talk to each other. I think uh, as a more strategic approach, when you have uh, the various meetings that you uh, have, one could have particular um, discussions and events on uh, vasopressin deficiency, the management thereof, including discussion of the name change. And to some extent, that's happening because there is a uh, debate at the European Congress of Endocrinology in May, and there's another whole symposium on this subject at uh, ENDO in Chicago in June. So that's mm -hmm. happening and there's every reason why your meetings, you could have a similar type of uh, awareness and a debate, but making it educational. So one is talking about the condition in addition to the name change. And I'd encourage all of you to, to really listen to and talk to patient groups, not just for this particular um, area of endocrinology, all areas of endocrinology, because you learn so much by actually listening to what the patients uh, are saying, because often what they say is different to what you may perceive to be the important issues. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. Thank you very much for this uh, suggestion. Um, last question. This is a little bit away from the topic uh, of today. Um, we, as young endocrinologists and uh, young career, early career endocrinologists, we are always happy to get some advices from uh, professors or uh, professors like you that had an amazing, amazing, or having an amazing career. What are your suggestions uh, for us? What are your advices um, for us as young endocrinologists? 
uh, ensure that you are, when you are managing your patients, that you are absolutely putting them front and center of everything you do and you fit everything around that. Ensure that if you're doing research, it's on an important topic that you're really interested in, that you'll answer appropriately. Um, listen to your mentors, make sure you have a mentor uh, and listen to the advice and actually make sure that you involve yourself with things that are beyond just seeing patients, education, research, get involved with the society that you represent on this call, but other societies as well, because that will enrich you and you'll interact with other people. Uh, and I think that will make you firstly a much better endocrinologist, but also it's a lot more fun and a lot more interesting uh, and it's just enriching uh, in general. Perfect. Professor Newell Price, thank you, thank you very much for your time and for this really great interview. And um, we hope to to help you uh, as uh, any young research committee also in spreading up this uh, uh, the new name change because it's very it's very an important important topic and uh, we will do our best to uh, to help this for, as you said for the patients um, because for them it's what why it's important is actually for for them to do it. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much. All the best. Thank you.